Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. You are being recorded. <laughs> if, please, um, if you are not okay with being record, recorded, then maybe you might want to either stay off camera or not engage in the chat. But for now, we are recording this so others may be able to enjoy this conversation a little later because they couldn't join with us today. But welcome everyone. Please drop in the chat where you're Zooming in from today. We'd love to know who's joining us and what is our representation across the world um, and across all of Prime. And we had a good number of people registered today, so we're waiting just a little bit for people to show up so that we can all start at the same time. So we, we will give people just another minute or so to just come in. Let's see, we have Mary from Massachusetts. Welcome. Um, let's see, we have Poland and we have, we have Carolina from Poland and Sri Lanka and Canada and the UK. We're going across, the. this, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. We're getting all, we're getting everywhere. Budapest, Kazakhstan, Boston. Oh, welcome. I love this distribution. This is awesome. <laughs> okay, so we've, we're about five minutes past. So to get started, we will do a an icebreaker. So this will require you to come on camera. So if you can, um, you can just come on camera for a moment. We do like to make this um, a, a more intimate kind of conversation, not too formal because we see ourselves as colleagues here as we're talking about things. So feel free to come on camera if you can. So this first activity is called the Joyful Scavenger Hunt. And if you've been around I-5, you might've heard us do this particular um, icebreaker before, but it's something simple. We call it the joyful scavenger hunt because we want to, I'll give you about 30 seconds to look into your space, look around you and see and find something that brings you joy. And then on the count of three, we will bring all of those items to the camera so we can see what are the, all of those items that bring us joy. And then we'll, I'll pick a few people to just share about what that thing is and why it makes you joyful. Okay. So Time starts now. Find that item that brings you joy. It could be anything. Let's see. Like, of course. <laughs> I'm gonna put this in here. I'm gonna bring, I have a sewing machine. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. All right. I'll just wait for anybody else. I'm waiting. I'm a pa I'm a patient facilitator. Know that. Know this. Very patient to wait for you to participate. Okay. If anybody else wants to join on camera. Okay. So on the count of three, we will show our joyful items. One, two, three. Got a whole little sewing machine. Okay. Keep them up. Keep them up. So then I'm gonna point to a few people to share. We're gonna spotlight you. So let's see. Uh. Zofia and David and Karen, can you share? Yeah, I guess the first one was me. Okay. So, yeah, this is my, the first item of this year's Christmas decoration. This is from the Nutcracker. I bought it last year and this is the most precious element of our Christmas decoration because the whole family is already trying to get that spirit. So currently the thought that we have just one month left and we will be able to enjoy the family environment and some, some uh, precious time together and some chill and relaxation after this uh, pretty hard semester this is the joyful thought for me and this nutcracker is a symbol for that thank you so much for sharing that I know many of us are looking forward to just spending some time with our family resting after resting after this long semester so I think I, I definitely identify with that too uh let's see I think next I said David David would you mind sharing uh yeah I got the photo of my two dogs in the background were hiking in a mountain uh, in this middle of snow. So I'm waiting for the holiday to roll around, but more waiting for the snow uh, that accompanies it and to get outside and do some hiking in the snow with these guys. So that's Aww. my joyful moment. Nice. What are your dog's names? Uh, the, uh, Cooper and Winnie. Cooper and Winnie. So Cooper and Winnie. Guy, Winnie's the younger one. Oh, 
Lovely. Thank you for sharing. No, all of us, some of us may be looking forward to getting in the outdoors. So I'm looking forward to that too. And Karen, I think that was, you were the last person. Thank you. A good segue there. This The postman brought me these just a couple of hours ago, which are socks, four millimeter wetsuit socks to enable me to go cold water swimming without my feet freezing off. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting in the water and enjoying uh, a bit of freedom from work and chilling out in nature in the cold water. Wait, so can, okay, I don't know anything about cold water swimming and I, I don't even, so what, what are you, so you, so you put on the wetsuit and like, you're just relaxing in the cold, like, can you yeah, swim? well, it, there's the whole benefits of being in ice, ice, cold water, snow water swimming. It's meant to be very good for you physically, but it's certainly good for you mentally to yeah, clear mm. your, your, your focus very much in the moment when you get into some cold water here in the UK it's about nine degrees at the moment so you're not needing a wetsuit we mm -hmm. save that until it's proper hardcore December January but no I very much recommend it it's, it's a big trend huh. okay I will look into that that's interesting I didn't even know that those socks existed so that's interesting so thanks for sharing that um all right, so we just wanted to share a little bit, you know, start our session off with a little bit of joy. It's good to start off with that kind of um, more positive emotion. So that's part of the reason why we did that. And also to just get us beginning to get us engaged. So for the next about 80 minutes, uh, we will be talking about I-5, um, the Impactful Five as a part of the Prime Project on the Impactful Five. I'm about to share my screen. Please know for those of you who joined a few minutes later, this session is being recorded. And so um, just to let you know, let's see, come on screen, here we go. All right. And so I would like to share with you what we will be doing for the next 80 minutes. Can you see my screen? Can I get a thumbs up? If you can see my screen, okay, good. Introducing I-5. This is the workshop we are doing today. Five impactful methods for developing responsible leaders. Yes, Giovanni, do you have something to share? Or were you raising your hand because you could see the slides? <laughs> that might've been what you were doing. Yes, I could see the slides, that's why I okay. did. All right, awesome. Thank yeah, you so thank much you. for confirming. Okay, so let's keep going. So. I am Amber Camila. I am the Senior Research Manager for the I-5 Project on the side of Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And today I am joined by two members of our expert pedagogy group who has been with us um, during this whole project, helping us to understand what I-5 looks like in their classrooms across the world. So I'm going to give them a moment to introduce themselves um, because they will be sharing some important examples today from their own um, context. So first, Chandrika. Hi, thanks, Amber. And uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Chandrika, I'm joining in from Mumbai uh, and from uh, an institute called SPJN Institute of Management and Research. I lead something called uh, DOCC, Development of Corporate Citizenship. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a faculty member in the institute. As part of DOCC, it's an experiential uh, unit, something that's embedded in the curriculum. It's a core part of what uh, our students undertake. Um, as part of DOCC, we go to rural India and spend about a month in rural India working with different kind of organizations, civil society organizations. Um, so about 360 students go to about, uh, should we say, 100 locations across 26 states in India. Uh, working on alongside listening and learning from organizations and while also going with their own skill sets uh, um, and uh, working on the different projects and issues that the organizations might be facing. So uh, and that's what we do in DOCC. I, I'll just leave it there and as we go along, hopefully we'll share. My own background is of course political science. I've done political science. I'm, I've done my management studies and interdisciplinary and somewhere in the journey, I lost my disciplinary moorings. Marina. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Chandrika, for passing on uh, the mic, let's say. <laughs> So yeah, I'm delighted to, to join Amber and Chandrika for the session. So my name is Marina. I'm a lecturer and researcher at IDC Blitz School of Management. Um, today I'm chiming in from my home office, which is close to Cologne in Germany, um, but I'm affiliated, as you can see by the name, to a Slovenian business school and um, get also spend some time in a nice location like the one that you can see in my virtual background. So that is the beautiful Lake Bled. Um, in case you haven't visited Slovenia or Bled specifically, welcome, welcome. Uh, join us um, if you are into winter sports or you know any time or type of summer activities, uh, both are very much welcome. And our business school is very keen on topics such as leadership and uh, sustainability. And um, yeah, that's why I'm very, very happy to, to join you for the I-5 Sustainability Management Webinar. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so as you all, some of you who are attending may know that we've been doing workshops um, around introducing I-5, but now we've been doing a series where we're also focused in a subject area or specific discipline. And so today's focus is sustainability management. We will be doing an introduction to I-5, really brief overview of it, but really looking at examples of what it means to practice um, the, 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 five, the main five methods in the context of sustainability management. So that will be our focus today. And with that, I want to mention that um, if this is your first time learning about I-5, please know that it's it's really will be a high level overview. And I encourage you to just note those things that resonate with you the most, and then go and um, read the playbook so that you can um, really go deeper in that particular area, because the playbook has all of the information in it. So you will understand that more as we keep going. So for our agenda today, we will have the warm up, which is what we just did and that what we are at still doing right now. Um, and then the majority of our time will be talking about the I-5 framework. We'll talk through the anchoring assumptions, the I-5 methods and signature moves. These are the components of the I-5 framework. And this is where you will hear more from Chandrika and Marina around their examples, their classroom examples or examples from their university. And then at the very end, we'll spend just a few moments with what we call the cool down, where I describe what will happen next after after the workshop, um, what comes next and how can you stay engaged? And then above all of these and through all of these, we hope that this moment that we spend together is enjoyable and it's a moment of connection that you get to discuss topics that you care about and that we all care about and that, that this is an opportunity to connect with your prime community. So that is our agenda for today. We just did our joyful scavenger hunt. This was our icebreaker. So glad that we got to learn about that. And over the next, now we have about 70 minutes, here are our conversation norms. Remember that the I-5 framework is holistic. We will be presenting it in a linear fashion just because that is what we will have to do with the time that we have. But it is very much a holistic framework. And so you will see connections to different parts of the framework. You will see connections that I might not mention, that Shandrika or Marina might not mention. And that is absolutely OK. And we want that because all of the elements are interdependent um, because we are trying to move towards holistic skills. And so we're using a holistic framework. So just keep that in mind. There is, there is no hierarchy of components in the I-5 framework. Next. Notice your mindset. Notice what's happening inside of you as you hear these different ideas. Um, uh, try to activate your curiosity, especially when there might be feelings of resistance or hesitation um, or just feeling like, hmm, I'm not sure if that'll work in my classroom. Um, and it's not necessarily meant to work exactly in your classroom because we see this as learning how to adapt something versus replicating it. Everyone's context is different. And so as you're listening to the different examples, activate your curiosity and your imagination to say, hmm, how might I adapt this in my classroom? Next, prepare to interact. Uh, this is not just a webinar. This is where you are just sitting there. This is something that is meant to be interactive. So not just interactive with us as presenters, but also interactive with yourself in the sense that um, taking notes and understanding what are you thinking? What are your, what are you feeling about these ideas? That's so important. Um, we know that we are all virtually connecting. And so we are in other environments that might demand our attention. 
But for now, if we can, try to minimize those distractions to the best that you can so that you can really participate in this learning community that we are trying to have for the next uh, uh, 70 minutes about. So be try to be present, reduce distractions, and show respect to others as we engage. Feel free to, at any point to jump into the chat and to add commentary, or if you want to raise your hand to share a thought, please feel free to do that as well. So these are our conversation norms. Next, as I mentioned that preparing to interact, making sure that your mind and your heart is active during this presentation is so important. So here's a thinking routine that we will offer you. It's based on a thinking routine from Project Zero called Connect, Extend, Challenge. But here we're only using Connect and Extend. I want you to take note of these questions and get out whatever note-taking devices that you typically use so that you can um, take notes of your own thinking and so that um, you can return to those notes afterwards. So these two questions are, which ideas connect with or reaffirm ideas and experiences <clears throat> you have already had? I'll note here that I-5 is not necessarily completely new. A lot of what you probably already do as an educator is intuitive and you know that it makes sense that it works. What I-5 might do for you is give you the language to be even more deliberate about those actions that you already are doing well. What it also might do is challenge you to do new things or to extend your thinking in new ways about your current practice. And that is what this extend prompt is about. What ideas extend your thinking, giving you a new idea or helping you to see something in a new way? We trust that because I-5 is intended to challenge the status quo in some ways, that there should absolutely be something here that can extend your thinking. So these are the two prompts we want you to reflect on throughout our time together today. So let's get into the I-5 framework. The I-5 framework has three main components. The first, the anchoring assumptions. These are the principles that provide the foundation for the I-5 framework. I'll share more about those soon. Then we have the I-5 methods. This is what the I-5 really is. Um, these are the, sh the shorthand for the five methods that make up the framework. Um, this, these are a broad description of classroom practices. We learned throughout our process connecting with the expert pedagogy group that the methods were so broad that we needed to get more specific about what those specific actions are um, that represent uh, each of the methods inside of business classrooms that have a focus on responsible management and education. So we took those I-5 methods and said, okay, we need to get to the, some specific actions and those are the signature moves. These are the specific actions that educators take in their classrooms that represent the essence of each of the methods. So I wanna share more about the vision of I-5. Why are we all here today? Well, because we know that there's a lot going on in the world. <laughs> um, there's a lot of tragedy. There's a lot of natural disasters. There's a lot of um, conflict. And we need leaders who can lead from a place of not just what might be the typical rational thinking of um, business leadership or who's just thinking about thinking about strategy, but someone who can lead with compassion, with ethics, with concern for people. Um, and so we need leaders with holistic skills. So how can these leaders begin to develop these holistic skills? This is our theory of change, that perhaps these leaders are coming from business schools. And what's happening in these business schools that could help these leaders develop those holistic skills that they need to lead the world in a more effective and loving and compassionate way? Well, our <laughs> offering is the impactful five pedagogical approach, that perhaps if educators use this type of approach uh, or use these types of methods that students would be able to develop those competencies of responsible leadership that we think they need to be able to lead the world in a more sustainable and holistic way. So that's the overall vision of I-5. And so here are the I-5 methods that we just mentioned. This is the each word that is capitalized here is the shorthand for describing that method. So make learning meaningful, keyword meaningful, foster joy and well-being, keyword joy, develop supportive social interaction. This is about the people, facilitate active engagement, how we're activating in the classroom, and designing for iteration, keyword iteration. 
as I mentioned, the you we have signature moves for each of these methods. This is too much to take in. As I mentioned in the earlier part of the session, we're not going to cover every single one of these signature moves. They are in the playbook on page 10. And so those items that resonate with you, make sure to go back into the playbook and read more about them because this framework has about almost 30 components and each of these signature moves is important, but we're not gonna go over all of them today. But by the end of this session, this, this um, overview should make a little bit more sense to you. But these are the methods and these are each of the signature moves associated with each method. And now to mention the anchoring assumptions. So it's so important that we talk about what is the base of our of, of the of the I5 framework because we pulled from various disciplines, cognitive science, psychology, responsible leadership. So what is the foundation of all of these things? What pulls all of these things together? Um, that's why we have these anchoring assumptions. So First, leadership is not only an individual position, but a complex process of social influence that shapes the thinking and action of others toward collective goals. So we're saying here that as we think about changing the status quo in the world and thinking about a new type of leader that the world needs, we're not seeing leadership as solely uh, positions of power, such as uh, any if you're a CEO, CFO, those positions, we're saying anyone at any level is engaging in leadership in some way. That's the position that the I-5 framework is taking. Next, why are we even here? Because we all believe that the sustainable development goals are vital for long-term business and societal success. This is what we're looking toward. So the I-5 framework, framework is saying the SDGs, this is important for us. And so that's a baseline of why we even have the I-5 framework and why it exists. Next, Responsible leaders and managers demonstrate self-awareness and ethical attention to others in the world. This is our very um, high level way of describing what we mean by responsible leadership. So every context will be different and will have their own definition of responsible leadership. So see this anchoring assumption as an invitation for you to reflect on what responsible leadership specifically means in your context. For, for the purposes of this conversation, we're focusing on self-awareness and ethical attention. Number four, after all, the I-5 is a pedagogical framework. So what do we have to say about how learning happens and what, in, what is involved in deep learning? We think there are a few characteristics here. Powerful and lasting learning involves holistic, interdisciplinary, and playful experiences. I-5 is based on the pedagogy of play, um, which has, the, has five playful characteristics. We translated those into our five methods. And so, Hopefully, as you are, you, as you're in this workshop and as you read the playbook, you'll see that playful has a much broader definition than what might be typically understood. Playful is a complex experience. It's not just something that's frivolous or something that only evokes positive emotions. Playful is interactive. Being a, a playful experience is something that is has an iterative element. That's something that you can do something over again. And so hopefully by the end of this, you'll see why um, a playful experience absolutely belongs in the business classroom. And lastly, um, to strengthen learning, business educators must shift from common models of presenting information, where presenting information being it's just that unidirectional uh, exchange of information, it's knowledge transition, transmission, what's here in the business school professor's mind needs to be put into the mind of their students. We're moving away from that. We're saying that to strengthen learning, we have to go move from presenting information to designing and facilitating dynamic learning experiences that enable students to construct their own meetings. So this is the, the anchoring assumption that is saying that this is a learner-centered approach. It's not a teacher-centered approach. It's about how can the learner activate their own experiences and engage in the learning? So today we are here because we're looking at how this relates to sustainability management. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and invite Shandrika and Marina to share, what do we even mean by sustainability and how do we embed this in the curriculum broadly? So I'm just gonna pause and, and invite Shandrika and Marina to share. Thanks, Amber. And I think uh, uh, you, you, you've spoken, uh, you know, you set the context about uh, for uh, why do we need leaders with vision. Uh, I think one of the things that we've been talking about in the Prime community is about that seven out of 10 uh, 
students coming out of uh, the current education system are coming out from law, economics, and management. That's almost 70 million uh, you know, participants worldwide who are coming out of uh, these, just these three disciplines. So uh, the wager is that some, you know, through our pedagogical tools, through certain experiences that we embed in the curriculum, you will have individuals who are responsible managers or leaders with visions tom uh, tomorrow. So at, le at least in the world where the, or the look where I'm located geographically, uh, one cannot just talk with such, I'm sure it's a worldwide, you know, you can't talk about sustainability just in terms of just ecological sustainability. You know, we are told when you talk sustainability, I mean, at least for me, it's also uh, economic equity. It's also social justice. It's also there. It's ecological justice, ecological restoration, and ecological justice across uh, uh, and then it's a certain awareness. So, uh, in that sense, sustainability. If you were looking at a sustainable future, you cannot have a world full of inequities. I think that is the idea with which at least my school approaches the whole idea of sustainability. And that is how we embed it into the curriculum. I was talking about DOCC earlier, which is development of corporate citizenship. The idea is that um, it's, it's, a, it's an experiential course. What you do is you send students out to rural India and you say, have a hands-on experience to what uh, are the kind of issues, ecological, social, economic, that the larger communities face and engage with. It's also a, 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 an ask from um, people who uh, are participants to go beyond the comfort zone, to think beyond the stereotypes. Uh, because breaking the stereotypes with which many of us live is, I think, part of it. Or going beyond what we are comfortable with is also part of the ask. And I think there's a wager here. Uh, yes, Mary, I do know Nietzsche. Um, that DOCC something, uh, she, she was associated with DOCC earlier. But one of the things that we uh, hope that DOCC will do is it, and when, you, when the students and the participants go out to uh, uh, different parts of uh, the geographies is you experience something uh, and on those experiences, you build certain memories. And on the basis of that memories, you acquire certain stories uh, and certain key concepts, which is a lived experience. Uh, and then you carry it with you. You carry it with you and it embeds somewhere and it niggles. So when you come, come back uh, to, you know, and you sit down in your corporate world or you're sitting, I, I mean, I don't want to be facetious here, but when you're in different locations, somewhere, some of the reality or some of the things that you've engaged to with or what you've looked and encountered stays with you. Um, and it comes out uh, when you make your decisions, you take your decisions. So um, that's how we embed it into the curriculum. Uh, this is, and as you said, it, it, and there are pause and reflect moments which are built over the period of that, uh, that one month, because you have to pause and reflect with the, the stories that you engage with, the people that you engage with, the issues that you engage with, um, and listen. Uh, and then listening is a critical component. Going with your skill sets to solve those issues, one part, but listening to how the communities or how uh, people think of their world is another, or, or problematize is another part of it. Hmm. I'll stop there and I'll let Marina take over about what she thinks about sustainability and you know, how she yeah. made it into the curriculum. Thanks so much, Chandrika. I think you summarized it already perfectly well. So I cannot add more to that or that I have more of a contradictory you know, perspective on sustainability. I think you portrayed it very nicely. Um, there's just one aspect that I would like to add from some of the recent debates that I had with uh, colleagues um, in, in, in my kind of bubble, let's say, um, sustainability colleagues uh, predominantly. Um, and where I've yeah, started, I would say, probably like seven, eight years ago, when still like the triple bottom line was kind of the framework uh, to teach. Um, for those of you in the sustainability domain, you all know the, the Venn diagram with the three bubbles that also Chandrika mentioned, the ecology aspect, the social aspects, the economic aspects, and that these are so somehow, you know, like, uh, on the same footing. I would say that this has not really benefited the discussion, unfortunately, um, which means that um, a lot of uh, my colleagues also criticize that framework and say, well, this is kind of 
very much exposed to misuse the framework and interpret in a wrong way so that the economic bubble is still like, you know, the main driver of the discussion on sustainability. And that this is actually like the Venn diagram log logic with three components is actually a weak sustainability. And so I have been um, showing a framework. I show both of these to my students and say, well, my perspective that I like to use is more the embedded sustainability or the strong sustainability logic where we have the embedded circles. The outer layer is the um, ecologic framework. Then we have a minor bubble, the social one, and then the small bubble is the economic uh, hemisphere. So that actually it shows that whatever is wrong, let's say in society or in the larger environment, uh, speaking of nature and, and the like, will have an ultimate effect on our economy. So there is this, you know, like logic that everything that happens out there, so to speak, will have an effect on the company and then also on the economic sustainability of the business. So um, that this is kind of my logic, how I also operate with uh, sustainability concepts. Uh, but that is quite an interesting discussion actually in the classroom, I have to tell you. So that is just some component I wanted to add, but nothing more in terms of implementation. I think, um, yeah, I'm facing the same struggles and, and you know, like ambitions as uh, Shandrika has already outlined. So I uh, would love to discuss that with you, um, of course, uh, later on if we have time. I wanna make sure we have time. So thank you for, Thank you both for sharing um, your perspectives there. So now, <clears throat> pardon me, we will keep going and learning about what is this i five framework that we're talking about more specifically. And so the first method is called make learning meaningful. Uh, this is about how you honor and emphasize the existing knowledge and experiences of your students um, and how you provoke critical reflection on relevant topics. This is about how do you um, bring in your students' experiences? How do you um, recognize their um, histories and also their passions and their visions and what's important and what matters to them? It's also about connecting to what is meaningful to you. Um, what is Where are your passions reflected in um, your teaching? And how, do, how is this teaching authentic to you as well? And so here are the four signature moves of Make Learning Meaningful, role modeling, the root word there being role model. So it's the idea that you can teach your students about being a responsible leader or manager, and yet could it be more impactful if you show them what that actually means? Because they're watching you, <laughs> that there's you in, in the way that you conduct your course, in the topics that you bring, the way that you connect with others, the way that you treat your students. How are you beginning to represent um, responsible management? And not just that, how are you showing what you're doing in like your outside life um, that you know, this isn't just about coursework to you, that this is something that really matters to you, um, that it even flows out into your more personal life. This is what role modeling is, is asking you to say, okay, what are those observable things that you do in your classroom that demonstrate what it means to be a responsible leader? Then personalizing, the root word there being personal. How do you make this personal for students? How do you learn about your students so that they can see themselves actually reflect, reflected in the course? And it doesn't feel like this entire course was just designed for a previous cohort of students. I don't know if you all are familiar um, or have had the same experience I have had where I could tell that the current course that I was in was definitely designed for someone in the past, um, that it feels like the course was an heirloom that goes from student generation to student generation and it lacks that integrity or it lacks that rel that current relevance. Personalizing is to say, maybe you might not be able to connect to every single student because especially for those large courses, but what can you do to make that student see themselves in the current course? This might look like um, you leaving space in your syllabus to be able to help to, to include readings that are more relevant to students or include authors that reflect their cultural heritage. Personalizing can look like a number of different things. With that, surfacing. Surfacing the base word there, the root word there is surface saying, okay, if we are trying to reach these SDGs, if we're trying to think about a new vision for the world, we have to go um, beyond just what's on the surface that is there. We have to go to the deep roots of things if we really want to make change in the world. So what is 
it, what is deeply held? What are those deeply held beliefs that students might have? What are those deeply held beliefs that other leaders might have that have led to some of the calamities or the disasters that we've seen in the world today? We need to go into those, dig them up and bring them to the surface so that we can actually look at them and see, okay, well, how can we change these things? That's what the signature move of surfacing is about. And that can oftentimes look like having critical reflection or doing an exercise like the five whys, where you say, why did this happen and why? And why and why so that we can look at the histories of things so that we don't repeat those histories. Next, you have dignifying, the root word there being dignity, um, being dignified. So this is concerned with um, recognizing that as educators, we have the potential to either upend or to reinforce some of the harmful power dynamics that have um, shaped the world that we're in. And that means looking at how you treat the minoritized and marginalized groups in your context. So how are you bringing them dignity? Um, how are you giving them voice? Because we recognize that as educators, we know that there are power dynamics in the classroom um, that we can reinforce or that we can upend in a way so that students know that they have a voice and we need them to know that they have a voice, especially those who have been pushed to the edges. So dignifying looks like bringing dignity to those particular students um, who, re who represent those particular groups. So that those groups might be racial groups, uh, it might be echo socioeconomic or religious minorities. It could be uh, cultural minorities. It could be based on gender or, or uh, sexual preference. All of those types of things that we know that if in your context, these are the people who are on the edges, how do you bring them into more into the discussion and more into the, the center and let them know that they belong there? So that's what dignifying is. And so another, I wanted to mention one other thing with surfacing as a way to segue to Marina, who will share an example. Surfacing is also about if I'm looking to see what is deep, what has gotten us here, then I'll be able to think about, okay, where can we go from here? Because um, I'm looking at the, the constructs of it. I'm looking at the foundation. And so that will help me to imagine something different because I know now I don't wanna necessarily include those components. So this surfacing can also be a way of looking, uh, of developing an innovative way to think about things because it, it's said that the same thinking that got us here can't necessarily free us in, in, into another place. It can't get us out of here. So if we start to have deep enough thinking where we understand what got us here, then maybe we can have broad enough thinking to think about how we can go into a different direction. And so that's about futures thinking. And so I want to give Marina, can you share a little bit about how you use this in your classroom? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Amber, for the introduction to the Make Learning Meaningful um, uh, component. So um, when I teach sustainability, or recently when I was uh, teaching sustainability, I, um, let's say, ventured a little bit into the field of, and um, some of you might know it, uh, futures studies. Um, which is, um, yeah, I would say probably also very much aligned to transformational studies um, and the like. So if you don't know the field of future studies yet, um, definitely uh, worthwhile to explore this. And I conceptualized the course on sustainable business um, solutions and um, uh, specifically catered to imagining a future of particular sectors. So for example, the future of the fashion industry, future of tourism industry from a more sustainable angle. And um, at the end of the course, um, predominantly, you can even do it at the beginning if you wish, um, I do a lot of reflection together with the students. So it's not only about the sectors um, and the sustainable, you know, like industries, but also about, let's say, a future me for themselves, like what they aspire, what they are interested in. And so I found this uh, web page, which is pretty cool. Um, it's like futureme.org. And um, if you visit the website, you can write a letter to yourself, uh, basically. Of course, also to other people, if you would like but um, it's uh, more of a reflection tool. And what you can see on the right-hand side is that you can actually toggle over the years so that you can look at, um, hey, um, is it like a letter I want to be released to me in one year time span or after three years, 20 years, whatever. 
And um, you can also then uh, read this letter with a certain, you know, time lag, uh, which might be very interesting for you. So maybe you made some promises to yourself in, let's say, the year 2023, and you want this email to be delivered to your inbox in 2050, for example, or on a very specific date. And um, it's a very nice reminder of, let's say, what you have accomplished, what you promised yourself to do, or maybe what you aspire to do. Um, and I use it with the students. They, they like it uh, a lot. And um, you can even do this if you are not into the digital sphere. You can also think about distributing postcards to students. Then you have to just, you know, file them and then send these out uh, to the students, like with a certain time lag. But then it's your responsibility to think about that you still have the postcards that you want to send them um, uh, in like maybe three or four years time. So this is more, let's say, an intuitive way. Um, of course, you have to make sure that you still use the same email address, um, but then it's it's quite an interesting exercise um, to, to have this as a reflection tool. And so that can be very meaningful for the students to reflect on themselves, on their own future pathways uh, to a more, let's say, sustainable future. And I can just say, I personally love this example because I use this and I've been using it for a few years and great. it's really great to get a letter from myself from like a year or so ago mm -hmm. to just see where my thinking was and to see the encouragement that I'm giving myself in the future. It's, it really is, um, I, I love the innovation of this, this idea. So I think using it in the classroom could be really um, powerful. I love this example. And Shandrika, I know that you also have an example, more of a story about how to make learning meaningful. I think this is a fascinating one. You know, you know this writing a letter, and I'm, I think I'm going to do that this evening to write a letter to myself for, for what, you know, what I hope to see a year from now, probably. Um, but yes, I think what's very interesting is uh, this, the, how do we confront the stereotypes that we have or the biases that we have? Um, and I think that's one of the challenges that we face when and, and with one faces when one engages with one's students and also with one's own self. So if you want to make that meaningful, we use one of the things we do so in the classroom is there are two components to it. One is looking at certain things and certain issues through the lens of the SDG. So there could be issues of gender, there could be issues of agriculture, there could be other things which actually are all around you but in, embedded in a certain kind of silence. And then to engage with that in the class and then say, carry those stories and into the, or carry those issues that you want to work on into the field or into remote parts of the country. Um, and I'm, just, I'm just going to share the story of at least, uh, as I said, there are about 150, 200 projects that are done every year by 360 plus 150 students from different set of courses. So in this particular course, I'm looking at this uh, the student of mine who was Basundra, who worked on domestic violence. I think she had her own set of biases of what woman empowerment went and what it should do. And she wanted to work on woman empowerment. Um, but she confronted, and I think she spoke to at least 25, 30 women uh, and did case studies around the issue of uh, domestic violence. In this particular case, this is a story of this woman who felt that she was at fault because uh, uh, you know she, that she was being subject to violence because she was not beautiful. And there's a story about how she tries to make herself beautiful by just borrowing somebody's lipstick and powder um, uh, while she's totally been burnt by her husband. And Vasantra, in a, you know, she has this conversation with uh, this lady here, um, and as she goes through this conversation, I think it becomes a journey into herself because she realizes that some of the questions, things where you think that the answers are very simple, uh, they, these are uh, deeply embedded issues, uh, which, you know, which have no straight, in, there's no uh, direct or easy answers there. Uh, in fact, at, at one point, Vasundra wrote back a story, uh, wrote back to us saying that, you know, that there was a point where she was sitting and listening to the story of this woman, and there was another person who had come in from Germany to work in the same organization. Uh, and the three women, uh, and Vasundra became the translator in the conversation that the, all of them were having. At a certain point, all three of them sat in silence, realizing that it didn't matter 
whether somebody was from rural or urban background, somebody from various different ge geographies, but they all shared a certain uh, set of experiences. I think those kind of experiences in the field are something that you carry uh, with you uh, in uh, different spaces uh, or carry into your life. Um, and probably gives, I, I don't know whether I would, I, a different kind of meaning, I would say. I don't know meaningful, but it's a different kind of meaning um, uh, for uh, all three participants. I just want to share that story. To just share what, you know, uh, some of the kind of experiences the participants go through or engage with the issues that they engage with in the field. Thank you for sharing that. I think also it just connects so well to the idea that it, it's not fabricated. <laughs> These are real stories of real people and what you do matters and how you think about others matters. It can affect your work. Um, and I just, um, I'm, thank you for sharing that story. I just think about um, the significance of that moment for the student and how it's probably not going to be something that they soon forget. And it's something that they can carry, it can carry on with them far beyond the classroom. Now, what is important is also that the woman wants to be you know, the woman wants to talk about it. She wants to, she doesn't want to face to be hidden. She wants to speak about it. Uh, in that sense, it becomes a meaningful journey all around. For the woman mm -hmm. who's speaking, who's sharing her story, uh, for the listener, mm -hmm. uh, who's, so the listener also becomes a site for a different kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the, and you become a trustee of that memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you become trustee of that memory, you've got to, take care of it and, uh, you know, carry it and tell it with the storyteller mm -hmm. and do something with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, that relationship that forms between the, the respondent or the storyteller and the sto listener uh, or women coming from different geographies and sharing shared experiences becomes meaningful in a different way. Mm -hmm. And and it also just connects to some of the other, if I'm trying to like bring it, pull this to I-5 and see connections, not only is it making it a lot more meaningful for the uh, the student and everyone who's involved, it's supporting, so it, it's um, supportive social interaction. So there's this bridging, that's one of the other signature moves, this bridging where you're bridging people across different experiences. Also it's braving because these are experiences that a lot of people might not have otherwise, but you're, you're um, inviting students into a space where they can develop the bravery to approach topics that most people won't talk, talk about directly. But how can we begin to, you know, make some of that change in the world if, if we don't address those complex, controversial, hard topics, those uncomfortable topics, um, so that we can find solutions and things for them. So I feel like this example hits on so many different things. And with that, we'll keep going to one of the next methods called foster joy and well-being. This is perhaps one of the methods that uh, feels the least familiar in a lot of business classrooms. And then we start with this qu quote from Paulo Fuere, which says, the task of the teacher, who is also a learner, is both joyful and rigorous. It demands seriousness and scientific, physical, emotional, and, aff and affective preparation. We must dare so as never to dichotomize cognition and emotion. This is to say that the classroom is absolutely a space for the heart and for the mind and for the body and for everything else. And that is what the I-5 framework is about. Uh, fostering joy and well-being is about fostering holistic wellness in, in your students by creating joyful experiences and supporting emotional, mental, and spiritual fulfillment. So um, fostering joy is it's like we want there to be good experiences that are like positive and, and happy in the classroom and also recognize that we're looking at the entire well-being of the student because we want to be able to give space to the full spectrum of human emotion in the classroom. So that's why it's not just foster joy, it's foster joy and well-being because we're looking at the whole person. And so here are the four signature moves, delighting, base word, root word, there is delight. This is about infusing fun, surprise, wonder, and celebration into the teaching and learning experience. 
Then we have sensing. Sensing, the root word there is sense. This is about providing space for students to notice and navigate a range of emotions within themselves and others. This is about developing emotional intelligence um, in the classroom because we know we need emotionally intelligent leaders um, in the work world. Then contemplating, the root word there being contemplate and using contemplative practices. So this is about guiding students in reflection about their inner spiritual and physical selves through contemplative practices and meta reflection. So contemplative practices being a range of different things. It could be meditation, a prayer vigil, walks in nature. It could be about, um, it could be silence, dance, a host of ways that you can bring the contemplative practices into your classroom to begin to foster that wellness in your students. And then lastly, the word rippling. Root word there is ripple. This is about enabling students to grasp the profound impact of both individual and collective actions in an interconnected world. So when we think about the SDGs, we know that these are not um, goals that can be reached by one group alone, um, one industry alone. Everything in the world is interconnected in some way. So how are the students' actions that they might do individually, um, how might they impact and ripple out into the world around them. This is about um, fostering systems thinking in your students and helping them to see um, that it's not just about the individual, but this is a collective. And in order for us to reach those SDGs, we must take collective action. And now I'll invite you, um, Shandrika, again to share about this example about fostering joy and well-being. Amber, you know, you're speaking about emotional intelligence and it's such an important thing. Um, you know, what we don't realize is sometimes uh, many of us have uh, embedded stereotypes and biases. Uh, you know, it's part of what we are. I mean, we won't, may not even realize it's just part of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes it needs digging in deep. So, mm -hmm. I mean, as simple as a process of allocation for off a project to a student brings out biases, you know, where a mm -hmm. student might think, okay, uh, I mean, the, and this, are we talking of one country uh, or, you know, or just one civilization, only one region? Uh, people might have biases about communities. People might have biases about gender. People might have of geographies. Uh, you know, North India, about South India, people might have biases and stereotypes about food, yes. uh, of of religion. There's so many, there's so many biases there, uh, which which are part of your everydayness. Um, so I think part of the journey is about the journey of self awareness as you go through this. Uh, especially if you're talking of well being and joy, and if you're talking of people discovering part of themselves and what they can give back to the community is part of it. One of the things, uh, you know, you said there's a ripple effect. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, are, many of the projects that our students go to and, and participate in as part of this experiential learning course is that they go and work with communities which have, maybe, I mean, which may be subsistence, uh, which may not even have two meals in a day or, you know, or I'm, I'm we're talking in terms of, 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 you know, with the Indian, if we look at what, in India, what poverty lines means, or what below the poverty line means, it's, it's very, very little. So you're talking of communities, and if you're looking for solutions then, if you're looking to try and find livelihood solutions, or engage with issues of poverty, then how do you think of solutions uh, where communities may have nothing, uh, or whose resource might only be waste, or whose resource might only be the forest within which, with which they live? How do you uh, so this particular story, which you know you have the photograph of out there, is where our some of my students went to uh, to an orphanage, and uh, they went in, uh, and this was uh, this was their DOCC project, and uh, the Prithvi, one of the students who was there, comes back and he said, you know, the first thing he and he writes in his notes, he says one of the things, but when the I stood there and I saw two kids bringing a a bed for me, and they were dragging. You know, these are two young kids of five years. She said, I was very angry that how, why are some adults making him do this? He said, then I, later on I realized uh, that it was uh, it was an orphanage and there were only these kids who could do it. 
you know, uh, there were several instances like this, which made them realize what it meant to not have parents. In this particular instance, is a joyful one because what happens is that they realize that uh, there was a festival of Holi called Holi, where everybody plays with colors. It's across the country. And uh, uh, Prithvi and Nikhil, who had gone there, realized that this, the children were rather feeling a little upset because the orphanage did not have money to have the festival. Uh, and the children, so, so, so what these two did, to cut a very long story short and a range of emotions that went through it, they took, they, both of them went and they bought the colors to have this, uh, to celebrate this festival. Uh, I think that just became, this is where everybody is playing holy and it became a, just a very joyful, I mean, which defined their relationship within that uh, organization with the orphans and their whole, and I think probably it's an experience that will probably carry with them in the lifetime and has also built and forged a relationship with their organizations. Uh, so I, these kind of small uh, tweaks in the curriculum, I mean, this is, as I said, it's part of the curriculum and, you know, one forgets it as a part of the curriculum, but it becomes meaningful uh, when it leads and lends itself to certain kind of how, you know, how the students behave and how they participate and part of how they give a part of themselves to the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that example. And Marina, I know you have an example here too. Sure, yeah, happy to chime in. And uh, Chandrika, thanks so much for sharing such an inspiring story. I think it's uh, really great what, what you're doing. And um, yeah, what I'm doing uh, with my students, and again, a short example that you could technically also factor into um, any class where it makes sense is um, that you could um, yeah, use uh, solar punk stories. So solar punk is a, a genre, I can also um, pop it into the uh, chat later, that uh, talks specifically about uh, sustainable futures. And um, in this specific example where um, I used it in was where I uh, picked the story and they are um, freely available on the internet. Um, it's uh, uh, the one on solarpunkstorytelling.com. And um, it's a story that is called Where Giants Will Stand. So it's quite uh, short. Um, so you can read it out in like 10 minutes, roughly. And uh, what I did with the students is that they were asked, and I did it in an online format back then, but you could technically obviously also do it in class uh, in like an uh, um, on-site setting, um, is to, to ask them to pick one of the roles that was outlined in the story. And then they were um, yeah, getting together into smaller groups and um, talking to each other from or using this like background of the story as a conversation starter so they were just picking up a story each of them and um, kind of um, yeah a character from the story and then just narrating the story from their perspective and how it feels to be one of these characters and so that was actually uh, quite interesting for them to also see how it felt to embody another character. And so uh, it was quite interesting um, that they were then coming back very, you know, like differently after being exposed to this experience to use some type of uh, storytelling and role playing um, to, to, to um, yeah, think about uh, natural environments, let's say in, you know, an um, alternate uh, future in a kind of science fiction, um, uh, yeah, outline. And you can basically pick whatever story comes to mind. So it doesn't have to be like from the solar punk genre. It can be from science fiction. It can be from any novel you enjoyed reading that has to do with sustainability or teaches you a lesson on sustainability, being it from the environmental perspective or social perspective. And they are quite a nice, let's say, uh, short stories out there. Um, I put a couple of more, um, yeah, let's say uh, collections on, on the slide here. Greenstories.org uh, is also an anthology that was collected for, for the COP27. 
Um, and there are also others um, that are also available free of charge. And it's quite interesting because it um, yeah, tells students um, or, or trains students to adopt a different perspective and it brings them also, um, yeah, the, or teaches them to have a different perspective on, on, on a whole new, uh, yeah, like kind of different story, but also different topic. And that is quite, uh, yeah, let's say, um, uh, very much challenging for them, but also um, very reflective exercise for them as well. And it also fosters joy because they also enjoy playing some of these roles. I also have a card game, which is called A Future Journey, where they can adopt different roles like um, future professions, so to speak, like a bee counter or, you know, like future drone manager or something like that. So I have a card deck um, with like 50 different future op occupations. And sometimes it helps them to think about how, you know, like vivid some of these futures can be if you're just thinking in, in roles and uh, adopt a little bit of the role modeling. Um, yeah, let's say benefits. So that's quite, quite interesting. And I enjoy using that a lot. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And I think this is an example of how you can take perhaps just an ordinary activity and make it just a little bit more fun and delightful and interesting for the students, because you could do something similar to this, where you just ask the students to forecast, you know, something in an industry or something, but this makes it more of a narrative. It makes it more of a story. Story. It can make it more meaningful for the students and can just um, improve the entire experience for the students. So let's keep going. So we have three more. We have about 25 minutes left and we're gonna go through the last three methods. Um, the next one is develop supportive social interaction. So this is about establishing a community in which students can observe, listen, dialogue, and effectively communicate with others with different perspectives um, and practices and cultures. And I just wanna note that there's a key word here when we say develop supportive social interactions, supportive, because you can have a number of types of social interactions, but we're saying um, supportive social interactions that truly support and advance the learning, that advance the students' um, connections and relationships, all of those things. And so I'll briefly go over the four signature moves of of this um, of this method. So communifying, this one was so important, we had to make up a word, which is communify, because we wanted to um, emphasize the importance of community building in the classroom. Um, this is about establishing a community in which students can really engage with each other in healthy, trustworthy, and productive ways so that they can begin to learn together so that it's not so much a competition where one student is trying to do better than the other one, but that they are all entering into this learning space that should be challenging in some way, um, where they can uh, support the other person, where they can help the, in, expand the other person's learning because of their own experience. They can offer tutoring or offer whatever um, and, and just make the um, learning community itself a safe place for them to take risks and learn new ideas and um, really be vulnerable because you know, true and deep learning should be an experience where you're challenged and where you're challenged, you are not always comfortable. Sometimes there's just some discomfort there and that's okay. And it's okay, especially if you are in a space where you feel safe and free enough to go there with yourself. So that's what communifying is about. And connected to that is braving, it, root word there is brave. And this is about guiding students to bravely engage in those controversial topics, complex experiences, and having those difficult conversations. So even going back to Shandrika's example, where she's taking this student to a space where they're able to address issues that a lot of people might not want to talk about, like domestic violence. Um, but being able to go into that and talk about it, and it benefits everyone who's there, but not just so much about just it being a benefit, but because we know that we know that this is an important topic and we're willing to go there, right? And so the next is bridging. Root word there is bridge. This is connecting students to different cultures, different disciplines, and different perspectives in ways that broaden and clarify their understanding. So again, what's so good about the examples that Shandrika shares in terms of the DOCC, where you're taking students and putting them in the spaces, is that putting them in those actual communities, is that it's not about the students learning about a community by just reading, but you're learning with the, these different communities. And that changes the experience and that changes the learning. So it's different from just exposing students to different perspectives and, and what have you. It's, a, it's dignifying 
even the groups of people that they're connecting with. So again, the 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 I five is very much connected. So bridging isn't just about exposing students to say like this is an exchange between different countries or something or a different neighborhood, but this is about truly deepening understanding so that we can get rid of those stereotypes that we might be using um, or minimize our use of them, so that we can actually engage with people as real people and, and really learning them and actually addressing our own biases about these things. So that's what's different about bridging. It's not exposure. It's not just merely exposure. And then teaming. So keyword there is team. All groups are not teams. And so the focus of this is to say, might you be developing group projects that involve, that um, have the students work together, but how are you designing projects and activities where they're not just working together, but they're learning how to be teams. They're learning how to develop interpersonal skills. This is about organizing groups, experiences that explicitly develop students' critical, communi critical communication and interpersonal skills. So those are the four signature moves of develop supportive interaction. And um, Marina, I know you have an example about taking a nature walk. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. Um, yeah, happy to talk about this. Um, I did this together also with a German uh, NGO. They are called Walk About You. And um, what we did was we did go on a nature walk. So we spend a whole day um, using different tools of outdoor facilitation methods. And um, these are pictures that were taken around uh, Lake Bled um, last year, actually in November. And it was a group of uh, 60 international students, so six zero students that we took outside for a walk um, from different uh, cultural contexts. And um, they were all management students. And um, what we did there was also, first of all, we wanted to re-establish um, the connection to nature by uh, not only bringing them physically outdoors, but also fostering you know, like mutual connections while we were going on outdoor walks. And, and what we did here specifically, you can use any reflection cards that you like or questions, but what we used were some of the questions around the uh, inner development goals that some of you, probably all of you know. Um, and these are kind of, um, or have been developed like after obviously the launch of the sustainable development goals. They're just a couple of years old. And the inner development goals are a framework of achieving this like sustainable transformation also for yourself as an individual, because if you are not transformed, how can you then transform the world, right? So it was more of a mindset um, type of exercise. And you can see that also in some of the pictures we had like um, silent walk where they were just walking, you know, like silently um, reflecting on certain questions in a, in a single row. Then we had like group exercises where they were standing in a park um, having joint discussions about uh, company visits that we did the day before. And then we also had like deeper, you know, like one-on-one -on -one walks um, where they were um, given a guided questions, uh, question from the inner development goals so that um, the students could like really dive into very deep uh, conversations um, that might go beyond some of the regular conversations that you have in classrooms. And um, the students really loved it. They said they had done nothing similar in their uh, masters and they were like um, very yeah, sad about this fact and said, well, it also fostered a very deep connection among the group, um, but also um, made them see more in, in nature. And uh, it also helps you, for example, we did one exercise where we explicitly used items from nature, let's say, um, yeah, kind of a leaf. And then students had to explain why this, like they connected to the symbol of the leaf, how it connected to their reality of being a student, how that uh, connected um, to their reality of um, how business and management is taught and so on and so forth. So also using these like symbols in nature physically, then also uh, to talk about um, certain issues. So really bringing this connection of business and nature closer together by doing something outside and by using uh, outdoor facilitation tools. And um, yeah, it was uh, quite uh, a joyful um, exercise as well. So not only social interaction, but also joy that was sparked.
Yeah, it's uh, Mary, I just saw your comment in the chat. Um, it's somehow similar to the forest bathing, I would say. It's not like identical, I would say. So um, from, from the Japanese uh, tradition here, but um, I would say there are a lot of overlaps when you look at outdoor facilitation, how it has been adapted um, in the Western context. I think it shares a lot of the, you know, like underlying trad traditions and like insights um, also when you go into the uh, academic literature on outdoor facilitation, you will find a lot of insights also from the, from the Asian uh, context. Yes, definitely. Thank you for sharing this too, because it makes me, again, it's it's a holistic framework. So this is connecting to different um, signature, um, signature moves. So there's contemplating, which is infusing contemplative practices into the classroom. So bringing in nature, um, which, and then of course, it's physical, which is, we haven't gotten to that method yet about facilitating active engagement, but it's actually animating the students, have, having them be energized in a different kind of way, making it a more hands-on experience. Um, and there's... If we keep, if we, if you ever want to take a deep dive, there's so much, so many benefits to just nature and being in nature, especially as it relates to learning. And so, um, I love seeing this example in that way. And we'll keep going. I want to invite Shandrika to share about, um, oops, let me go backwards, about this experience. Um, with one of the students who's in the program. And I wanna just hear from you, Shandrika, which as you think about this particular experience with this student, what signature move would you say that this most represents that from, so, from developing supportive social interaction? So I, uh, you know, uh, since we're trying to build a community and uh, what we do, uh, and, and this is the method that's built into um, the way the way we allocate the project. So, so what typically what the students get is they, they get a choice to the theme that they want to work on. We do on the themes. We do not start SDGs is not the starting point. The organize the projects on which the organizations are working is the starting point and the organizing point, and then they are mapped onto the SDGs. The way the students are mapped is that they're asked about the themes that they would like to work on. It could be women empowerment, it can be climate action, it can be uh, a caste, it can be uh, water, it can be a livelihood, it can be poverty, it could be any of the 16, 20 top issues that we work on uh, or our communities work on. And then the students are given projects randomly. There is a certain rule that you have to be 450 kilometers nearly, you know, from your, the, your hometown. You do not want them to be in their comfort zones. You want them to push them out of their comfort zone. Secondly, you build, because there are 360 communities and their projects, some are individual projects that some put locations together. You want the group, which is not usually together or which does not necessarily know each other before to go together. Uh, so hopefully they will build relationships, build relationships with each other, which they have not been able to build over the last one year, um, but, all, but also with the community where they have to go. So I tell them uh, one of the things in the pause and reflect moment is to ask them what they have built the relationship on. And the relationship can be with anyone. It can be with the respondents. It can be with someone in the organization. It can be with a dog or with the tree that they have got used to sitting under or it could be with someone where they go out and have a breakfast in the morning. So you, uh, the other thing we're saying is open up, don't just privilege your eyes, privilege all, all senses. Can you privilege the smell, the sound, the touch? Uh, uh, and can you bring back those stories and those experiences back to us when you tell us the stories of, from your field? So um, in as part of the evaluation process, you have different pause and reflect moments which builds this community. So you're saying, tell us what you first feel when you reach there, uh, because you're uncertain, uh, and there's a larger context with which, uh, from your cohort with which whom you are going to your stakeholders or the community with whom you're going to be there, which is new. How do you build relationships there? Or what's your first impression of them? As you go along, tell us how you build those relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us stories that stay with you. Um, uh, um, tell us stories or or even and not stories just of individuals, but stories even of local culture, food, whatever. 
that you know that you will probably carry back with you. So those are the kind of uh, and, you know discussions or kind of things that we ask them to think about. Listen actively, engage actively, and if you need to be still, because it is not necessary necessary that you have to be active. So because sometimes you need a certain kind of stillness to think deeply. So acquire that stillness in that location, which is actually very, very quiet, to think deeply if possible. Hmm. Sorry for going forward. I didn't mean to do that. But I, I love, this connects to so many, and I just have to give everyone this example. It's so good because... Um, so if you all recall, one of the signature moves for meaningful is about personalizing, right? So this is about connecting to the personal student's interest. And so in Shandrika's example just there, it's like, okay, what are the student's interests, right? But then the way that the project designed is to say, okay, we're going to give you a project that may or may not align exactly with your interests, but if anything, we want to make sure that it takes you outside of yourself, <laughs> So you have to be engaged in a place that is 450 kilometers away from you because we want you specifically to be able to have a different kind of experience. So I think those two signature moves complement each other so well. So it's like, it's not just personalized, it's both personalizing it and making sure that the student, that you're creating a bridge for the student to go to something completely different. And then it connects really well to this, this next um this next method around facilitating active engagement because you are animating because in the sense that to animate is to actually engage the students in something that's hands-on, that's bodies on, that's physical. So it's a physical experience, which makes it authentic. Um, so uh, th this next one is about authenticating. The root word is authentic to say, we're creating real experiences for students. Students, I mean, experiences that students will actually encounter in the real world. Um, and that is so, so I just feel like this, not just feel, this example just hits on so many of the signature moves. And it's, so, it's such a strong example because it makes it vivid for the students. It becomes a real experience. And then it's linking them. So link, it, link um, is about linking students to professionals, to different organizations that will matter for them in the, in the real world. So in their professional career, um, being able to connect them to nonprofits, connect them to mentors. And that's exactly what's happening in this program. I mean, in, to, in this particular project, um, because students are engaging with the actual, you know, the nonprofit program personnel, learning how to connect with them in, a, in an actual real way. Um, and so it just, it connects to all of those. And so I just think it, it's such a strong example. And I also want to go back to something that Shandrika said about silence. So um, when it comes to animating, sometimes you might feel the pressure as an educator in the classroom to kind of perform, to try to make the students get engaged and try to, you, you do all of this stuff to try to get them engaged. And sometimes that doesn't, it doesn't always help the students. And that's because it really has to be, it's, it's more so about you creating the conditions. This is what this definition here is, creating the conditions for students to be motivated, to participate and personally invest their energy. So you can create those conditions. And also, it's about how do you leave space in your classroom for thinking? So animating isn't always just about it being super like, it doesn't always have to be about it being super physical or super hands-on, but also minds-on and hearts-on. How are you giving, how are you using silence as a tool in your classroom to give space for that thinking and that emoting to happen? And so even using silence as a very specific tool to animate your students in another type of way. Um, that's also what facilitating active engagement is about. And lastly, this signature move, this last one called teching, this is another uh, word that we had to create because we knew that something had to be said here about technology, because how, how you engage students with technology in your classroom, how you help them um, learn to use technology in healthy ways, whether that's building their digital literacy, helping them learn how to surf, thinking about their own digital well-being, how you're using technology to enhance the learning experience, 
that's what teching is completely about. Because we are in a technology immersed world, how are you using technology in your classroom to expose them to the technology that they might be using in the future? Um, how can you bring that into your classroom and get and begin to get them to be able to use it in a way so that they can have a leg up when they actually leave um, and when they graduate? Because we know the technology, one technology only points to the next technology because by the time they're in the, in the real world, they're probably going to have a whole new technology to have to deal with. So that's what uh, teching is concerned with. And we have about seven minutes left. And so I'm going to keep going and I'm going to just at least get to uh, uh, the next, uh, the final the final method here, and then I'll go back and leave the space for examples. So this last method is designed for iteration. And this is about incorporating cycles of performance and feedback that provide opportunities for students to take risks, experiment, learn from mistakes, and make changes in thinking and actions. And so when you think about design for iteration, it's really about saying, okay, in the real world again, if we're if we're making if we're being leaders if we're making decisions if we're trying to make changes in the world we need to know how to fail <laughs> because failure and mistake making and making errors and going through all of that that is a part of life and in order to really get towards something like something even better we can't be afraid of that. Like we know that it's going to happen sometimes. So where are students supposed to build that muscle of failure <laughs> or where something doesn't work? Or maybe if you if you don't use the terminology of failure, but perhaps you use the terminology of like, this is a mistake or this is just a learning. How do you help those students strengthen that muscle? That is what um, design for iteration is about, giving students that space to go through cycles of learning. So exploring is something that you might encourage them to do, which is you're creating spaces where there's, maybe there's not a specific grade attached to it, but there's just a space for them to um, explore an idea or to just mess around in something. And then prototyping is about saying, okay, how can you, you give your students the opportunity to create something, get feedback, and then create it again and revise and edit um, as they might typically do in the real world. Like how can you give them, your students that feedback cycle around a project and then revisiting, revisit keyword there is to say, how do you expose your students and help them to see that, to see their learning journey? So learning doesn't just happen from A to Z, right? There's so much that's happening in between there. And so in order to strengthen that learning experience and to help them see what learning really is and to help them navigate mistakes and take those risks, you help them see their growth along the way. So revisiting is about helping your students go back and, and reflect and to see, okay, where, where was I learning? And then it can also help them prototype, make better prototypes of something, make better decisions because they're able to see, okay, this is where this happened. This is where this happened. This is how I can improve. And then compassing, keyword there is compass. This is um, about showing your decentering grading. So we know that students in most of our institutions are we are required to give grades, and so we might be, might not be able to get rid of grades so quickly, um, but we can at least um, decenter grading in the way that we talk about grading. Because how can students really enjoy the learning experience if it's mostly about the, that grade? And we do know that that a lot of times what impedes students from really experiencing the learning is because they're worried about that grade that they need to make. And I know I've taken a class in the past where it wasn't, and maybe you can relate to this too, when you think about your uh, college experience where maybe you don't remember really what you learned in the course because you were just trying to get that grade. Um, so this is about changing that uh, schema as well with your students so that they can really, you're, you're giving them instead like, okay, this is the direction that you're going in. You're north, south, east, and west of whatever the learning goal is. But, uh, and you're beginning to think about alternative forms of assessment that you might use in your classroom. So that's what that one is about. So um, I know I had to go a little speedy on this last piece. Um, and I also, I wanted to, because we just have about three minutes left, I wanna give this quick example of 
a, a way to iterate in your classroom because a lot of, as we've seen in the I-5 project, people have really been challenged with this one. Um, this is a quick example of three students in one exam. So student one writes the question, student two responds to the question, and student three assesses the response in the question, and then they decide on a final grade. So what this does is it totally flips what an, what an assessment is supposed to be. It's not just individualized, which connects it to, remember what we talked about earlier, communifying, having that learning community. It makes the learning become a shared experience. And then also, if the students are writing the question, it makes it more personal to them. It makes it more meaningful for meaningful to them. And it also helps them see what others find to be important. So there's so much more here in this example, but this is just a small way that you could say, okay, like how can we decenter the grading, really put the learning back into the students' hands and into their thinking and making it more personal and making it a shared experience. So with that, we have, we I hope we will get another um, moment to be able to hear some of these examples from Marina and Shandrika. Um, but now that we've reached the end, I hope that this um, dot, this particular diagram makes a lot more sense to you, or at least a little bit more sense to you from the beat since the beginning of the workshop. Here are the five methods and here are each of the signature moves. Remember, as we're looking at the next steps, Go back to the thinking, go back to your own thinking and your own feeling, what happened for you in this section, in this session, what ideas are connecting, what ideas are you extending to and reflect. That is like one of the most important things to do next. What's next? What you do after the workshop is much more important now. Reflect, take 15 minutes to do a self-assessment. I'll share a link. We're still in the project. And so we're still trying to learn from you all, but read the sections of the playbook that re resonated with you the most. Don't start with everything. Just start with what you really felt like, hmm, I'm drawn to that because there's much more that you could do, but just start with that small thing and reflect on why that matters to you and what you might want to do in your classroom. And then try something small. It doesn't have to be a whole, like you have I-5, you don't have to redo your entire course. Do something you've already done, but now that you have the I-5 language, do it with more intention. Be pardon me, be more deliberate about it. Or if you want to just try something new, try something new and small, and then come back and let's have a conversation about it. This is the I-5 Cafe where you can connect informally with other Prime members who are also trying to practice I-5 in their classrooms. And the next one is December 7th. Um, you can register for it on um, i5.umprime.org. That's where the calendar is for the same place that you probably registered for this event. And that is all. So this is the self-assessment. I'll drop this link into the chat for you. If you have the time, we would love for you to be able to just let us know how this workshop went and just kind of how these ideas are resonating with you. Um, and then that's it. So thank you for joining us for this workshop, um, taking the time out to come. Really do hope that these ideas were meaningful to you. Thank you, Shandrika and Marina for sharing your ideas. Sorry that at the end, we just kind of had to speed through things. Um, but the stories are great, and I feel and I hope that I that Prime we can organize more events where you all get to share um, your examples. So that is all we have for today. I'm going to drop in the link to the chat, and um, that will be all. So thank you all so much. Hope to see you again at another time. Bye bye. Thank Thanks to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.